Capes on the Couch podcast is for entertainment purposes only. Dr. Issues is a psychiatrist, but he is not your psychiatrist and does not have knowledge of your individual situation. For any personal mental health concerns, please consult your own health care providers. For medical emergencies, please call 911 or the designated number in your area immediately. Remember that you are not alone and help is out there. Hello and welcome to Capes on the Couch, where comics get counseling. I'm Anthony Sitko. And I'm Dr. Issues. This is issue number 70, Political Terrorism in Comics. Our present level patron, Matt, has requested this topic. And Matt, as always, comes through with a wonderful and very interesting theme. He seems to be fond of those. I and- absolutely hate you, Matt. I'm kidding. I'm kidding. The whole point of this, though, this is pretty heavy. I just I get a little scared when we have topics like this because sometimes we think they're going to be lighter and they end up diving deep. Sometimes they just go completely sideways. So, yeah, yeah, this one, I think, is definitely not going to be a light and airy episode. And uh, as such, um, before we even begin, before we get started, I want to give a content warning that some of the stuff we're going to talk about is obviously going to be potentially disturbing, could be potentially graphic, um, not necessarily in the language, but just in the the ideas and conceptually. And so this may be an episode that you want to skip if you are easily upset or triggered Um, I'm just putting that out there just as a precaution. I know in addition to our normal disclaimer that we put at the beginning of every episode, I just want to make clear that this is not going to be a light and fun episode. That's next week. Right. Next week is a light and fun episode. We've got the tick. That one is going to be goofy and stupid and all sorts of wacky, zany fun. This one is not. So if you are easily upset or squeamish or what have you, Wait till next week, and I promise we will bring you nothing but joy and saccharine goodness with the tick. So a little bit of minor housekeeping, as always, before we get started this week, I, I want to give a shout out to 90s Court. It's a, a 90s themed podcast, uh, as evidenced by the title, Lisa and Andy argue a court case uh, about two aspects of 90s pop culture and the fans vote on who wins. So they'll take two popular movies and pit them against each other or I think they did Mortal Kombat versus Street Fighter and so on and so forth. And they will argue their cases for their respective uh, pop culture ones. I know they did Pokemon Red and Blue versus Pokemon Yellow. So they're technically on hiatus right now from season one, uh, but they will be starting up season two very, very shortly. And in the meantime, you can go back and catch a lot of very quality episodes. So you can find them wherever you listen to podcasts. And I believe uh, they're on 90s Court on social media. So you can check them out. They're a friend of the show on Twitter. And so I want to give them a a shout out and a plug. As well as we have this week a review read. Uh, Luz left us a five-star review on Apple Podcasts. And I think they referenced, I think he mentioned on Reddit, because I posted in one of the podcasting subreddits, just the weekly link to the episode. And he posted in response and said, oh, I just listened to the episode. I loved it. And I left you guys a review. So Luz, if you are listening, thank you so much. Uh, we, we welcome your review. I've just finished listening to the Bane episode, and I really like the format and content. Keep it up, guys. Yay! So, Luz, as we have said before, if you send us uh, an email at capesonthecouch at gmail.com, and you just say, hey, I'm Luz, I was the one who left you that review, and you send me uh, your address, I will send you a sticker because that's what we're doing. So, and uh, to the some of our folks and our patrons and our fans, uh, I sent out a bunch of stickers. I know this weekend, uh, or I guess last weekend, um, you know, by the time this episode comes out, uh, those stickers will have been sent out. So uh, we appreciate everybody who, who listens and sends the support via reviews, comments, what have you. And uh, so I guess I've beat around the bush long enough. Let's, uh, let's just jump right into this very heady topic terrorism (laughs) so oh my yeah there's there's really no way to just sort of sugarcoat your way into that so terrorism in comics just by way of background because as with all of our thematic episodes that matt likes to do for us there will be no skit and there is 
a, a different background and there's no real issues. There's no treatment. It's just more of a conceptual discussion around some questions that are raised. Um, and I would not want to do a terrorist skit anyway at all. Yeah, I don't think that one's going to be very entertaining. So terrorism in comics has basically existed as long as the medium. Um, for as long as there have been comic books, there have been secret organizations that are hell-bent on global domination in some fashion, mad scientists looking to usurp the world order. In World War II, there were a lot of organizations that had connections to the Axis powers. In World War II, either Germany or Japan, there's a lengthy history of terrorism in comics. And then we move forward into the 1960s. You have in the Marvel Universe, you have AIM, Advanced Idea Mechanics, and HYDRA. Those are two of the big organizations. In DC, you've got the Council and HIVE, the Hierarchy of International Vengeance and Extermination. I mean, there, there's a long list of, of terrorist organizations and individual terrorists within these comic universes. So I'm not going to go uh, name them all. And um, and you, as well as the big two, you've got other publishers writing similar timely stories. The American, uh, written by Mark Verheiden for Dark Horse, uh, depicted a superhero who was killed trying to stop a hijacking in Beirut. And that was, I believe, in the late 70s or early 80s. And uh, so I was reading about that. And so as we are almost two decades into the war on terror, uh, which is interesting because Matt, who requested this episode, Matt and I in college hosted a politically oriented talk show, which is basically then we got kicked off of the radio station and we went to live internet streaming. So in essence, we kind of had a podcast. If you, if the way I think about it back then in like 2002, 2003, I we, listened to it. I downloaded it every chance I could. TCNJ Talks. Version 3.5. That was, in essence, a podcast, and we were recording an episode when the U.S. began military strikes on Afghanistan in the fall of or early 2002, you know, whenever that was that that we began Operation Enduring Freedom, whatever the title of the military strikes that led us into this quagmire in the Middle East, but I'm not going to delve into that too much. So depictions of terrorism in comics are now currently deeply rooted in real world geopolitics. Um, they still provide some social commentary on modern events. The current run on Captain America by Tennessee Coates has a character called Scourge. He's killing police and innocents in an attempt to befoul the name of Steve Rogers, who had previously been head of Hydra during the Secret Empire storyline. So there's a whole litany of things that basically current comics are now taking the very, uh, very ripe social commentary stance, both uh, domestic and international terrorism and using it as fodder for storylines. And uh, one of the big stories that Matt mentioned in his request for the episode was V for Vendetta. So now you've got V, who is Alan Moore's unscrupulous hero anti-hero he's kind of villainous Main character i've had this protagonist yeah i've had this discussion with people offline actually not even with you but with other people where i say i'm willing to call him a main character in no way would i classify him as a hero but since so much is focused on what he's doing and how he's doing it i'll give him credit for grabbing the attention he's the protagonist of the story i think we can agree on that as as neutral of a term as that is and uh so he functions essentially as a terrorist against an authoritarian government so it's it's a matter of in the v for vendetta storyline it's definitely a matter of comparing and contrasting who he's going up against because in a clean story or in a, in a better universe v would absolutely be a villain but because he's going up against folks that are so blatantly black and white evil that by comparison, he's gray, you know, very yeah. similarly to, I would argue, Michael Corleone in the Godfather saga mm. is not a hero in any stretch of the imagination, mm -hmm. but because so many of the the characters that he is dealing with are far more unscrupulous than he is, he becomes the 
hero by default. And of course, the Mm -hmm. whole point of the Godfather trilogy is we see the corruption of Michael Corleone from military hero to whatever Whatever the hell happens in Godfather 3. The less we speak of that, the more, the better. So that's V for Vendetta. And then also another Alan Moore story, because Alan Moore seems to like his terroristic films or, mm-hmm. or stories. <laughs> um, he likes the stories. He does not like the films. Um, Watchmen. And you said Ozymandias, the plot to unite humanity against the common alien foe is accomplished through terrorist methods. Yeah. I'm going to drop a giant alien squid in the middle of New York, and it's going to kill thousands, if not millions of people. Yep. Not to but mention, it's going to bring everybody yeah. together. But yeah. The people that knew the plot, he made sure that they were all killed. The person that he wanted to blame on things going wrong or one of the people to blame on things going wrong, he gives the gives multiple strangers radiation poisoning so that the person that is radioactive gets blamed. He does every step in a terroristic way. It's horrifying to think that he wanted to get this ultimate positive goal for the entire world by doing everything absolutely to unite them in fear. Whoops. Yeah. And we see that now with the Watchmen TV show, which I have not seen. Mm. But from what I understand is very fantastically done and is set decades following the squid attack. You have a terroristic police force attacking citizens, which if you look at the current climate in American politics today, You can definitely draw a corollary between some of the things that have been said and protested against there and Watchmen. So there is there's a lot. And terrorism, I think if you just look at the dictionary definition of terrorism, you know, using fear and violence to achieve a goal, it is not nearly as it's a clean definition for a very broad topic. Any number of things could be considered terroristic. And so when dealing with depictions of terrorism in comics, we have to be very careful to delineate between the goals, because I think that's that's a key uh, that's a key point in defining what terrorism is. What is the goal of the individual committing the heinous act? What is what is their end game? Is it for their personal betterment? Is it for some loftier goal? Is it to cause anarchy? Is it to create a regime change in a government? Is it to, is it out of vengeance? And there, there are so many things. And so sort of, I know we were talking about offline on how to prep for this, and it's really I don't think either one of us are entirely qualified to answer this question, but we're going to do our best or at least very ask the question. Doc, what makes a terrorist? Well, thank you for really dropping a bomb on me. And I don't mean that as a joke. First, I want to give a disclaimer. I am a U.S. citizen. I'm going to have a view that's very common to many U.S. citizens. I'm not trying to articulate that our methods are the best when it comes to government, military, or anything of the sort. I am also not trying to discriminate anyone who has been on a different side of a war or conflict, whatever you want to call it, just to give that disclaimer ahead of time. I think I already hinted at it by definition, terrorist, terror. So the idea is you are going to use fear to accomplish your goal. There's another part to this, though, is scale. In other words, I am not a terrorist because I want to get back at my, let's just go ahead and say big brother and punch him in the face for all the mean things he did to me as a kid. You have to at least get to the scale of dealing with hundreds, if not thousands, if not hundreds of thousands, if not millions, if not billions of people in your scope. So there has to be a certain level of, I don't want to say narcissism automatically, but you have to recognize that your goal is of such importance that you know you need to have an impact on so many people. So you have to have a certain level of comfort in that realm. And yet, in general, there has to be a certain level of Privacy, secrecy, confidentiality. In other words, many of these 
attempts at changing society come about because you can't let people know ahead of time that that's what you want to do. Or even if you've mentioned it in the past, it has to be so remote or so buried that people don't immediately call you out. So in other words, to take modern examples, if I say I want to find a national landmark and I want to damage it in a way that people know that I mean business, I can't say that to anyone that even knows what that landmark is or where it is because they'll just say, um, yeah, I'm, I'm just going to call the police right now. And uh, you're you're not going to be able to do that. So there, the necessity of anonymity while still maintaining the motivation for power, it's, it's something that doesn't always go hand in hand and that makes it incredibly difficult to pinpoint. In other words, if someone wants power, and I'm not saying this uh, as, an, as an insult, I'm saying, for example, future NJ Gov. If someone, no, 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 I'm not, I, like I said, I don't mean that as an insult. I'm saying if someone wants to be in a position of power, they usually let it be known because they want support. They want people to rally around them and make it a positive cause. If you're going the route of terrorism, you're basically saying, I'm so against the grain of what society deems as acceptable that I have to find a way to garner the support of others in a way that no one else can acknowledge. And I'll admit that's so foreign to me, I can't say I know for sure how people go about doing that on a consistent basis. You can have one-on-one conversations privately with someone and get to know what their motives are. But then to be able to scale that, to be able to expand that, to get enough people that you're able to make an impact on a national level or a state level or a city level even, that's kind of tough to do without someone spilling the beans. So you have to have a certain level of charisma. You have to get people to buy into what you're saying so much that they're willing to throw away almost everything else that they know about in their lives and society. Because once again, if you reach out to anyone else that comes even close to not really agreeing with you, they're going to rat you out. I don't even mean that in like the snitches get stitches kind of way. I mean that just more in the, I don't want society to get destroyed kind of way. So it's fascinating that not only are we talking about these well-organized, highly efficient, brutal tactics to get change in the world secretly, en masse, without anyone knowing ahead of time so that the events actually happen? That's something I, I'll admit I, I still can't quite get my head wrapped around. That's a good, cannot comprehend evil kind of but, question. Well... <laughs> I mean, yeah, that uh, the other part, of course, is we're still talking about people that are human. And so by that logic, we know that we're still talking about people that have the same types of drives and motivations that the rest of us have. So I think of it from. For example, if we want to mention on a smaller scale, if we mention things like cults that develop communes, things of that sort. Many times taken in a vacuum, the lives that they build for themselves can be quite superficially positive. You end up with the acceptance of people that truly, in theory, care about you, that want to see you succeed, that are willing to sacrifice their own for a greater good. Those all sound like positive things. So when you hear that initially, you can't just automatically dismiss what the person is looking for. For example, we mentioned Viva Vendetta. If you think that society is actually being destroyed by the current regime that's in place and you want the world to survive, I can understand the motivation to go ahead and do everything possible to undermine the government. That, in a way, makes sense. Why it has to resort to violence is a different story. But ultimately, 
people will usually respond much more quickly to something that's destroying lives compared to something that isn't. So it's a basic tenet of survival. I don't agree with it, but that's kind of irrelevant once you get to that point. We've had some people use terms like by any means necessary, or we don't always think of them as violent people, but obviously when you get past the point of normal interactions, then you can go ahead and just eliminate that construct. Once you eliminate that construct, then everything becomes fair game. You mentioned the idea of anarchy. I've actually had the opportunity to talk to some people that consider themselves to be anarchists. And at no point did I ever feel personally threatened by them. Their main point is that society at large doesn't get so many things right. And if every one person has their own agency to make their own decisions for their own personal good, you'll end up with better results than trying to get everyone, quote unquote, everyone to agree to one certain construct that is going to end up leaving people in the lurch. Once again, don't necessarily have to agree or disagree with it. The point is, once you reach the threshold of violence, it throws everything out the window. At least with most things that we consider to be war, we know that there is a battle on one side versus a battle on the other side, and we have come to the conclusion that one side, once it wins, the other side is going to concede. That's our basic concept of war, which I hate, but I acknowledge is still something that most of society has done for centuries, millennia. Terrorism throws that on its head because the other side doesn't have to concede a thing. They can continue with that motivation no matter what. You're not winning a war because the other side never loses. As long as you have people that have that certain belief willing to act on violence in secrecy in order to accomplish a social goal... It doesn't matter if it's a small cell. It doesn't matter if it's a nation. It doesn't matter if it's a culture, a religion, which I don't think is true, but I know certain people feel that way. Just saying that as an observation. Then you're fighting the wrong battle. You're not connecting with people in a mindset that you've never encountered before. And when people don't feel heard, when people feel like they literally are the alien in Watchmen, then they have no reason to acknowledge your existence. When you have people that have that mindset, you don't have an opportunity to bridge that gap. These are just a few things that have been rattling around in my head for decades. I don't even know if they're totally accurate because I'll admit this is not my expertise. But there are things that I've seen so many times at this point that I think it's better to say them than to left them unsaid. Well, to follow up on the one point that you made, um, you, you drew a comparison and contrast between war and terrorism. I think one of the other key things, the other key distinctions between war and terrorism is that war is fought between combatants who have either been conscripted or who volunteer to fight. And there are rules there are parameters for war. In terrorism, anybody is a target in theory. You have, they're literally called soft targets because they are not enemy combatants. There is no uniform that they wear to designate that I am fighting you, you are fighting me. It is strictly you are in a place in theory or you are a random individual picked for no reason whatsoever, completely arbitrary. That speaks to a terroristic mindset or to a terroristic capacity. The idea that any one of us could be victim of an attack at any time is horrifying. And you and I are both of an age where, again, we remember 9-11 and we remember the immediate aftermath. There was that fear that Americans were attacked on our soil and it could very easily happen again. And that fear was then used and weaponized by political actors, I will just put it that way, to 
further their own personal agendas or their own political agendas to enact legislation. Fear, and we've, we've mentioned this in prior episodes, fear is a phenomenal motivator. And so if you have proof that they attacked us and we didn't see it coming and it can happen again, we must stay mm. vigilant. We have to... Mm. We have to be on guard against them. Whatever that nebulous them is, that is almost just as terroristic on the populace as the original attack. Because now you're being told you could die at any moment. And that is terrifying. That is terror, the pure definition of it. So I'm going to expand this and bring it back to comics because I'm sure there are a few people if they've never listened to us. Yes, this is how we talk on a regular basis. But just to make sure we recognize we didn't forget the comics, I'm going to bring up something we didn't bring up here. Civil War. The idea that sometimes people with certain abilities and powers with what they do can create such a mindset with the people that they're now viewed as dangerous. And therefore, you have a government that says, we need to regulate this. We need to register all the superpowered people, whatever. And you have some people that fight against that and say, like, wait a minute, I, I need to be myself and I don't need another layer of bureaucracy to tell me what to do. I'm cleaning this up because it's way more emotional than that, as it should be. But the thing that you mentioned with this, that the response to a terrorist action can lead to just as much damage in cleaning up the mess is absolutely true. My question then, I guess, to, to bring it back is, is it worth it? Do you then just simply say, we know that random people did this thing and, and we acknowledge it, but we're, we're not going to attack. We're, we're not going to change our own way of living. We're not going to change our legislation. We're not going to make new laws or rules that are going to govern how our society acts. There's a inherent problem with anything involving terrorism because you can't possibly have a lack of an emotional response. It's not possible. I've never seen it. You can't be blasé. I mean that from the individual standpoint to the top of the food chain. You know, whoever it is. If it's a president, if it's a king, if it's you know, whatever. You're going to have to have a response. And for better or for worse, you're going to have some sort of change. It's it's horrible to say that because I don't want to advocate and say that terrorism, by definition, creates lots of massive changes. It creates reactions. It always creates reactions. So from that standpoint, it's not much different than if someone's in a personal relationship, to bring it back more to what I know, if someone's being abused, if someone is being attacked, if someone has that type of response, they have the potential to develop depression. They have the potential to develop an anxiety disorder, trauma, PTSD. You almost end up, based on what I observed with, as you mentioned, the 9-11 attack, I thought it was classic that society as a whole was developing some traits of PTSD. The hypervigilance, the immediate, intense, impulse reactions and, and irritability, easy irritability, the anger. Seems pretty common. The way we were inundated and flooded with the media news about this, the pictures, the all of that, even days and weeks afterwards. I mean, that kind of reminds me of nightmares. The fact that we honor it on each anniversary. Is that a flashback? I don't know. I'm just bringing this up as possibilities. I'm not saying that that's really the way it is. But also, I'm willing to acknowledge something when it comes to this. That I think it's an example of what we can do 
when we combat something that happens in a negative light, that there are ways that we can come together and actually be a better society for it if we don't allow it to infiltrate everything we do. Right now, we have our voices being heard by who knows how many people, both now and in the future, simply because we're willing to have a microphone or two to discuss things like this. And at no point during this conversation, even though we're live streaming on Discord, do I think to myself, I wonder if someone hears this, if they're about to storm into this house and take everything that you and I love away from us. I don't worry about that. Why is that? Because in theory, the types of things that we have heard about that have ex- that other people have experienced in their lifetimes, just the fact that we're talking about this topic in, could possibly put us at risk. And yet, I don't hesitate. You don't hesitate. I think that says a lot about the fact that whether or not terrorism is something that evokes a reaction, it doesn't mean it, quote unquote, works. So... To get back to your original question, what makes a terrorist? A person that feels so desperate that they don't think there are any other means for how to get their voice heard in society, and yet still have enough of an ego that they feel like they have to use violent methods to bring forth some of the things that they want to see. I mean, we could we could go on and on about this, but I do want to sort of key in on the one thing that you said that their goal is to get a reaction and that it's impossible to not have a reaction to terrorism. It's the scope of the reaction, I think, that dictates what kind of a society you're dealing with because a response to terrorism should be, in theory, proportionate and it should be balanced and rational. But as we often see, those re- those responses, at least on the individual level, are rarely that. And so you compare and contrast the reaction of individuals versus the reaction of a society. And I think an individual can certainly have a visceral emotional response to that act. But as a society... It is imperative that we take, that we collectively take a more measured response. And the problem is that requires a level of discretion and subtlety that is very difficult, if not impossible, to enforce on society. And so what you end up with is a society that falls victim to the whims of the individual emotional responses. And when you have leaders or you have prominent voices that hold sway over large sections of the populace, their individual emotional responses then bleeds down to the people who are interested in or who follow. And that can be very, very dangerous. And as I was uh, almost saying earlier, that that can almost be terroristic in and of itself. The response to terrorism and the idea of stoking fear. I, you know, I mean, I, there are so many things I want to say, but I don't really want to turn this into like no, a no, real, a real time political discussion. Yeah. yeah. But it, it, it reminds me though of, something that's been done so many times. We did the offshoot episode of the review of Joker Endgame. Okay, you have his Joker thing. You have the Scarecrow with his fear gas. You have, wow, it's going to be a lot of Batman things. You got Ra's al Ghul with what he does. You have so many people that point out, if I do this to everyone else, then you have to listen to me. You don't have to agree with me, but you have to listen to me because I've made it very clear I can destroy everything around you. What comics allows is it allows usually a singular entity or group of small, not in size small, but in number, people to directly act and thwart whatever these plans are. In general. 
we get to see resolution. We get to see things in a light that allow for the populace to have some sense of comfort, usually. We don't get that in real life, at least not as often as it's portrayed in comics. So this is an example, I think, of the medium allowing for potentially a more mature growth in what we would expect to happen versus what we see in reality. That's kind of comforting in a way, in my opinion. Well, that ties into the next question I was going to ask, which is both to the real world and to um, comic books. Although for comics, it could simply just be up to the writer. Is it possible to have a world where there is no terrorism? Yeah, if everyone has no conflicting goals or objectives. Absolutely. If everybody had the exact same motivational factor, started from the exact same point with no other imbalances whatsoever, and therefore had no variations in their mood or circumstance, yep. So so guess where I put that on the uh, probability scale? I'm going to put that as big fat zero. Exactly. So, and I, and I asked that question intentionally to be overly facetious, mm-hmm. but my point mm-hmm. is... Do you think it's possible, and I know we're never going to be able to eliminate the notion of terrorism entirely, but is it possible to get to a point where the notions of fear and political terrorism in the real world is drastically reduced and to, again, tie to tie this into comics because I don't want this to be an entire discussion just about real world political events. Is there a way that we can model the real world based on any comic book depictions of utopian societies or near utopian (laughs) societies? Is there anything we can draw from those lessons to either say, do this or definitely don't do that? I think so. We can definitely continue to strive towards getting that type of positive equilibrium. Absolutely. I think it comes, once again, down to scale. The idea that one voice isn't heard is an inconvenience. The idea that multiple voices are not heard is a problem. And the idea that whole segments of society feel like they're absolutely ignored, downtrodden, or or discriminated against and and harmed leads usually to the type of outlash that can result in terrorism. Whether it's based in what we would consider to be reality or not is not always relevant. How the person feels is always their genuine experience. And so the idea is what can we do on these smaller scales so that they don't become grander scales? That is where I think we can model what at least I've seen in comics in the past, because sometimes it's a little too trite for my taste, but many times it it comes from either a misunderstanding or an unfortunate set of circumstances. I'm I'm doing my best not to evoke a a certain uh, children's uh, book series. (laughs) Uh, But anyway, the, the point being If we're able to acknowledge those things ahead of time, we don't even get a story. That's something that I love to do. I like it just in my spare time when it comes to even my favorite movies, comics, novels. Try and figure out early on in the book, if this one thing just didn't happen or if this one thing was handled differently, we wouldn't even have any of the problems for the rest of the story. I know because having been, you know, your best friend for over 20 years that we've had this discussion where movies, this whole thing could have been avoided with one conversation or if somebody had asked the question the right way or if somebody didn't react poorly to a particular stimulus. Right. But that's, I mean, that's the storytelling principle is that there has to be, in in fiction, there has to be a conflict so that you can arrive at a resolution. I don't know that you necessarily need that in real life. There doesn't have to be exactly. that original conflict. Exactly. If you can supersede that conflict with communication, then you circumvent everything else. Yep. 
But how do you get there? And that's where I'll admit kind of stuck. And in all honesty, society in general has been stuck up until, I think, this century for the most part. We've had communication, obviously, for centuries. It's just that the way we communicate took long periods of time. Either you wrote it down and you hoped someone read it, or you sent people out to talk about things and then you hope that their version of whatever it is you want said gets said in a way that's not going to tick off the other people. Those aren't exactly conducive to immediate resolution. In other words, you can have decades-long periods of time where people just automatically start developing their own fantasies about what's going on with other people either across the planet or even across the street. And it can be allowed to fester and grow. In theory, we now have a situation where we can mitigate that pretty quickly with modern technology. And yet, what are we really experiencing? The opposite. Uh Uh-huh. Exactly. I think it's because the immediacy of the communication leads to a lack of time to process because the information and the discussion is instantaneous. There's no time to mull things over. In your reference to earlier methods of communication, if you read something, you couldn't respond immediately because you had to go and write things down. You had to go and find somebody to talk to. You had to go and really take an effort to respond. Now, it's as simple as just clickety, clickety, click, and there you go. And so how many times do they say, if you're really upset about something, write it down in a letter and then don't mail it. Right. But you get your thoughts out there and then you come back 15, 20 minutes, a half hour, or you know, a day later and you read that because now the stoked emotions have hopefully had an opportunity to subside and you go, boy, I really got worked up over nothing. So I think in the, in that regard, that is something that uh, the openness and the the speed with which we communicate does a disservice and I think leads to a lot of those voices and those ideas that otherwise would not have gained traction in decades prior. Now, because you can hit that nerve and somebody else gets really pissed off and they see that and they go, yeah, and it it just, it escalates Mm. and escalates. Mm. And then you have folks who intentionally stoke those flames, knowing that they're going to get a reaction. Mm -hmm. That's what a troll is. And I just want to take Mm. like an aside here Mm. because I see all the time that people... uh, make reference to, oh, they're, they're trolling on the internet. They're, they're trolling this and that. Trolling is not just saying something mean. Trolling is saying something to provoke a particular response. And to me, a good troll is the one who says something in a way that it's not readily apparent Mm. that they are going for the response, Mm. that they're playing dumb or they're obfuscating their true motives Mm. to get that response. Mm. And that to me, that's trolling. Not just saying something mean about something on the internet. The the term has lost all meaning as far as I'm concerned in Mm. modern discourse. Trolling when it began was, I'm going to say something stupid so that you, I'm going to say something intentionally stupid so that you get upset and you, you respond. And then I go, ha, ha, ha. I baited you into this. Mm. That's that's trolling to me, but I digress. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. To get back to your point of the immediacy of responses, or the best way to say it, don't press send. That's true. So then I raise the question to get back to what we were talking about. What's the middle ground then? Because I think we've come to an agreement that interpersonal communication And the breakdown of that communication is what often leads to such discrepancy of ideas and and motivations for a better world 
that we end up with. Sometimes I like to view terrorism as a one way conflict. In other words, I'm so mad about something that I'm willing to act violently towards it while you don't nearly care as much as I do. I think that's that's a very fair and accurate depiction because so much we see of terrorists is one side and they're saying, I'm going to eliminate them. And the them does not want to eliminate the person committing the terrorist act. By and large, the the hatred and the vitriol is so one-sided. But then again, back to the original question then, or or I guess mm-hmm. the underlying question, how do we eliminate that? How mm-hmm. do we level the playing field? Not so not in the way that, well, now both sides hate each other equally, right. <laughs> but how do you reduce the level of hatred that would drive the terrorist to get to that point? There would have to be some visible and visceral demonstration that the tenet of the terrorist cell is wrong. Or maybe wrong is, is not the proper word, is not is inaccurate. Because much of what we see is based on that person's perception of their reality. If they think that they've been the target of injustice, God's among us, if they think that society has turned their back on them for whatever reason, then they are, through confirmation bias, going to see every example of that on a regular basis. So whether intentionally or unintentionally, every action of that target is going to be scrutinized. So what actually needs to happen then would be that target, once again, I think intentionally, but even if it's unintentionally, giving examples that don't match the script. So if we're going back to a, a, a you know a comics example, if all of a sudden this dictatorial regime going hail Hydra, making all of these horrible weapons and and whatnot, if they noticed that society is sending care packages to their soldiers' families without even asking because they noticed that their overall income is lower than any other army in the world and they don't want them to starve even though they consider them to be an evil organization that sounds super weird and yet because it's so off-putting the first thought may be like well what's your deal what's your angle is this poison i can't i can't accept this and yet all it would take is a few soldiers to say you know what actually i got one of those packages and that was some of the best food i ever had you know maybe those other people aren't so bad after all even if they're fighting a war against us they don't have the right ideas but they're they're still civil enough that they recognize that we're suffering. And it just takes enough of that discord within a group to really start to dissolve it. Maybe it's still going to exist, but it can exist on such a low level with just the Red Skull standing there saying, I'll get you next time. I'll find more people that believe in what I believe in in terms of domination. That it doesn't impact nearly as many people as it would otherwise. So would I go on to say that can it be eliminated? I don't know, but it definitely can be mitigated and it can be done through direct acts of kindness, in my opinion. Just that basic. It's very, very, very difficult to remain so intensely angry of a group of people when they just constantly, constantly, constantly demonstrate that they are showing goodwill towards you. Just an observation. I have no idea if it would actually work because I'm not in politics or government or anything like that. But I will say on a small level, I don't mind someone like, let's say, Ned Flanders. We know how much Homer hates Ned, but... Stupid sexy Flanders. That's kind of the point, though. Homer, as we've seen, can be actually a very destructive person in in general. And yet, because of the way someone like Ned treats him, even though he can't stand him, 
it usually ends up for the better because what's he going to do? I can't, as, as you said, forget the sexy part. Just you, you, you really don't go after people like that. I mean, even if you do go after people like that, we've seen the, we've seen what happens with that. If you assassinate Martin Luther King, if you kill Mahatma Gandhi, it doesn't destroy their positivity. It doesn't destroy their movement. So as long as you're bringing forth the greater good and true positive things that society can at any moment and you continuously do that, that's just, in my opinion, as powerful as the idea of trying to invoke fear and anxiety in the populace as long as you actually have the true motivation to do it. It can't be fake. Just saying. Was that uh, fear cannot drive out hate? Only love can do that? Yeah. Yeah. That's it. So we basically need Mr. Rogers to come back and lead us all to a better society. Which reminds me of that trope that I know you know so well. The idea, whoever said it, I loved it. When he went back in time in the movie and he came back as that old man, it makes a lot of sense with Steve. Oh, yeah. Oh, man. That, I love that Steve that Rogers idea. went back in time and became Mr. Fred Rogers. Yeah. Yeah. True, And I truly believe that. I really do believe that. And And if people want to give feedback and say that I'm too naive, so be it. That's okay. That's quite all right. Because once again, what's the worst I can do? Just say that I recognize you have a different opinion. And I do hope that things work out for the best for everyone. I I, I don't understand how someone's going to get mad at me for that. That's, that's exactly my point. If I approach life that way, there may be people that still get mad at me. But once again, what's the level that they can get mad at me for? And, and if they do go too far, then I know for a fact society as a whole really, really reacts in a positive way to show that there's still love in the world. So it's it's that's true anti-terrorism, in my opinion. Yeah. Yeah, because that person would say, no, I'm angry. You need to get angry to match me because I think deep down somewhere they understand that you have to come back at them in order for them to justify. They need to feel justified yep. in their anger and their terroristic response because if you're not matching them then they feel foolish they feel embarrassed which can anger them further but they're they will be less inclined to do anything about it so the the last question that i want to ask and this is you know certainly on the, the clinical level how are terrorists treated psychologically all right. or is that too broad of a question all right so so i'm just gonna walk away right now because <laughs> <laughs> I, oh man, it, it's not that it's too broad a question. It's that it is no different than saying, how do you treat a criminal or how do you treat, treat a rapist or how do you treat a child abuser or how do you treat a thief? In other words, I just need to know that person. How do I treat that person? What is going on with the, with their mindset? Is this a matter of a pure power trip? They don't actually care for the underlying causes. They just figured that this was the greatest way for them to obtain a position of authority. Is it a true vendetta? They want revenge for negative things that have happened to them in life, and they want to make as many people that they consider to be the target to suffer as much as possible. And they want to exhibit violence and get their rage out that way. Is this despair? Is this, is this depression? The idea that the world isn't worth it. And if it's not worth it to me, then why would it be worth it to anyone? And to take another trope, some people just want to watch the world burn. If that's the case, each of these circumstances would require a different approach. If it's someone, as I've alluded to so many times, on the narcissism level, then, okay, I have to appeal to that. But I also have to make sure that in a way they get that a bit under control and recognize that, they are fallible, and just because they're in charge, it doesn't mean that everything is now the way it should be and perfect. If it's depression, then of course I have to work on what it is that has led to that level of insult to who they are that maybe I can help, 
you know, bolster that so that they can develop the types of positive relationships that make them think that life is worth living and the world is worth saving. If it's a matter of anger, rage, despair, after I pump them full of medications, I'm joking, people, I'm really joking, kind of, then I have to review what is it that allows them to have a positive outlet for that anger that's going to produce more positive results as opposed to negative results. So that's on an individual basis. Now for the part that's the elephant in the room that I have to admit. Depending on what it is that this person has done or what they were planning to do, you need the right person to treat them. And it may take a team of people to treat them. Because if you tell me, for example, that this was a person that had plans to destroy the United States and they had targeted our own area, then I would be the first person to say that I cannot treat this person. Because of the transference and countertransfers that would be going on, my first thought is, why are you still alive? Why on earth haven't you been executed yet? That's just me making an honest statement. So I have to be cognizant of that sort of thing. I can't be so naive to say, oh, yeah, 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 I can put that aside and I'll just look at this as a human being. While for me personally, I think that there is a grain of truth to that. I also know that there is enough of that natural visceral response that I would not be doing that person a positive service if I were treating them. I would need someone that is not as close to the situation and I could give feedback as an observer of what the person is exhibiting from a psychological standpoint, but definitely not as the direct provider. And any clinician that doesn't recognize that from the start or doesn't acknowledge it from the start, I think is actually an even greater risk to that person. In other words, I also don't want a person that says, oh, yeah, I'm totally fine. I'm, I'm, I'm totally neutral or or impartial. Really? You live in this area. You had something that may have impacted your family and your family's family for generations to come. And you say you have no opinion on it. That's not that's not being honest with yourself. So from that standpoint, I want someone similar to and this this may be just one of those things that gets passed down from generation to generation. I have no idea if it's true, but I remember reading that when someone is signing up to be an armored vehicle driver, one of the questions is, have you ever thought of robbing a bank? And if you answer no, you're automatically disqualified. I have no idea if that's true or not, but I'm just saying that's kind of what I'm getting at here. In other words, be human, be honest with yourself, but also be honest in what range this is for you. If this is something that invokes initial immediate anger response, then clearly it's not for you. If it's something that's a little more distant from you and you still recognize, though, that you had a human response, you might be a good candidate to help treat someone one on one. If you don't acknowledge it at all, then get that worked out for yourself first before you try and treat anyone that falls into this category. That's the literal catch-22. Is anybody, you know, the the crux of that story was, I forget, mm -hmm. about being insane to fly and say, oh, well, I'm, uh, you know, I can't fly these missions because that's crazy. Well, then you acknowledge that you're sane because you're, you're requesting not to fly. So therefore, you right. can't back. So... I, I'm, I know I'm messing up the analogy. No, no, the, I get your point. But but the point is that you have to acknowledge that. And that is what, I guess, delineates the, the sane from the insane. Yeah. Part of it also, though. That self-awareness. Right. Part of it that I've also noticed, though, is where not just an individual clinician, but all of the other associates that are dealing with that person. They probably, and, and I, I may get some flack for saying this, they probably have a greater impact on that person's development than the individual clinician. In other words, the person that is providing the food every day, being courteous, saying things that acknowledge that person as a human being, the security, if, if we're talking about someone that truly is a terrorist, like has been confirmed, you know, whatever, the security that provides them with human dignity, changing from one set of fatigues or, or you know, whatever, you know, prison attire or, or, or whatever, 
and, and, and saying, I, you know, I just want to make sure that, you know, these are decent. I, you know, I appreciate that these are washed and, and, and folded appropriately. Little things that show basic humanity. And obviously the way I'm talking, you could tell I'm not just talking about terrorism. I'm also talking about prison. I'm talking about any situation where a person is being incarcerated for things that were negative, that, that had a bad impact on society. That is just as critical to that person's rehabilitation, in my opinion, as to the one on one sessions or the medication or anything like that. You're trying to demonstrate that society hasn't left and society hasn't broken down just because you feel that in your view, everything is broken and they're willing to show it to you that it's not broken. And they're willing to do it on a consistent basis, day in, day out, for as long as you are going to be in that circumstance. It doesn't matter if you're in there for murder for life or you tried to destroy an entire city. Either way, if you give that common courtesy, if you're someone in Arkham Asylum, I know we've had the discussions of why do people always seem to escape from there? How horrible is their system and all of that stuff? Throw that away. I'm saying, what about the guards and orderlies and all the people in these places that are able to have the day-to-day interactions, time in, time out, every hour, that allow that person to recognize that there's still something about themselves that's worthy of that human attention? That would have a much stronger impact than anything that I say in a half-hour session, in my opinion. Wow. Never considered that, and yet it seems so patently obvious. I really don't know what else to say. I think our entire system has been set up where we we try and key in on these one or two people that are going to turn everything around. We actually follow much more of a model that would be consistent with the dramatics of a comic book, and yet we don't realize that the quote-unquote mundane things are the things that really have the impact in everyone's personal life. We just don't like to think of it that way because we like to think in highlights. We like to think in the pinpoint moments. And yet, the fact that that person has suffered with something for every single day where they got to the point where they knew they needed to do something to change the world in a violent manner, we think that that happened overnight. We think that it was just that one thing that did it. I doubt it. Really doubt it. Maybe it is as dramatic as not getting into art school. Maybe. Or maybe it's the fact that you grew up in a society where your money basically was used as building blocks for kids because of hyperinflation, in addition to the fact that you thought that certain people were being marginalized to the point that you wouldn't be able to have a standard of living that you thought you were going to have as an adolescent, which we already know creates a significant amount of emotional turmoil with your hormones raging. And then you get the final straw of people not acknowledging the fact that you're working your butt off to try and get something that you think is going to be a good thing for the world. And nobody else seems to care because everybody looks at these other governments that are doing such great things. Why can't our people do that? kind of sheds a different light. And I'm sorry for God winning the conversation, but my point still stands. And I may be wrong. I'm sure historians are going to yell at me for saying that. I get it. But at the same time, I'm saying what you do 364 days of the year carries way more weight than what you do in one. That one may impact a life and it may be the highlight, but that doesn't happen with all of the other footage that creates the real. Didn't think we were going to reach a point in the conversation where we were humanizing Hitler, but yet here we are. And and that's something I've had at conversations numerous times with, with people. Um, he did horrible things. He ends up being a horrible human being. I am not saying that that's not what happened. I'm just pointing out that if we don't ever look at the human side of humans, how the heck are we going to combat something that they think is going to be beneficial to destroy other parts of humanity? Sorry, I, I apologize. I, I'm, I, I'll admit, I do feel strongly about this. No, it's, it's very obvious you do, and I don't want to uh, entirely discourage the conversation. I, it's, it's very nuanced, and it requires a level of subtlety, both in speaking and in listening, that I just frankly don't think we have the time and capacity for on this show. And I'm not entirely certain it's, it's 
germane to the topic. Change the name from Hitler to Red Skull, and we have a similar conversation, though. People actually got stoked when they saw Red Skull in that other in that other realm and, you know, in Avengers Endgame. I mean, we, we recognize that there are other sides to people, and yet it takes dramatics like that to think about it. It's 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 interesting. And, and Hitler is something that is relevant to this and that. How did he die? We know how he died, right? Yeah. OK. No, the reason I'm bringing that up. Suicide is what we know is, is something that you do when you feel like there is no way out. Well, how did he get to that point? He felt like he lost. Well, if he felt like he lost, what did he lose? He didn't just lose power. He lost the sense of himself. If he lost the sense of himself, who was he? We know who he was. We know what he ended up being. How did he get to that point? And anytime we start to delve into that, we get scared. Why? Because we don't want people to ever get to that point. We're going to talk about terrorism. Let's talk about the ultimate terrorist. If we're talking about the ultimate terrorist, then let's go ahead and, and explore it. And that's that's part of why this is so difficult, because as you can even hear in my voice, how angry I get about it. So. Now we're supposed to rely on psychologists, psychiatrists, social workers, personal counselors, all of these people. Th this is how we're going to get through? I don't see it. I, 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 or it's difficult for me to see. Let me, let me put it that way. It's difficult for me to see. For a one-on-one -on -one person to be able to deal with that? Ooh. I started writing an op-ed piece of sorts. And uh, in the... the process of writing and in conversing with uh, some friends and family, they persuaded me not to write it because of how it could be perceived. But my point was that I felt that the depiction of Nazis as the ultimate evil, like the baseline, that is the standard, that is the purest evil you can be, is a Nazi. My argument was that that was detrimental to the very notion of what constitutes evil because you have dehumanized them so much that you make it impossible to say, how can we get there or how can we stop folks from getting there? And how can we make sure that this doesn't happen again? Because as soon as you pin the needle there, so to speak, you've eliminated any opportunity for discourse, you've eliminated any possibility for rehabilitation. And I, I was going, I had such lofty ideas as to how to write this. And all anybody, when I mentioned this, all anybody said to me was, you're going to sound like you're defending Nazis. And that's not a good look. And that because the, the truth of it was, I was not defending Nazis. I was trying to say simply that the fact that we have pinned the needle on evil on Nazis or the Red Skull or whatever, if you delineate that ultimate evil and you say that is the worst you can get, well, now you, you've you've screwed up your scale, so to speak, or or again, it was it was a work in progress, mm -hmm. but but it tied into so much of of what it was that you were discussing mm -hmm. and. But again, nobody wanted me to talk about it because of those very ideas that, mm -hmm. well, you just you get so irate. As soon as you say the word Nazi, you God win the thread. You mm -hmm. you immediately. That's it. Mm -hmm. And my point was that that shouldn't be the case mm. that, yes, they're evil. I wasn't at any point trying to downplay mm -hmm. the evils of Nazism, the entire tenets mm -hmm. of the party, mm -hmm. but that they're still human mm -hmm. at the end of it. And mm -hmm. that if you're completely throwing away their humanity, then that says just as much about you as it does about them. Mm. Strong but, statement, man. Strong statement. Yeah. Yeah. The same way that to bring it back once again to, to the comics. How, how many times have we seen these villains become anti-heroes, even direct heroes, whatever the case may be. The whole point is that if I could change, and if you could change... Okay, Rocky. Hey, 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 hey. I had to bring something to the table. Oh, in terms I know, I know. Of, I, I, there had to be some kind of a joke oh, here man. at some point. I, I mean, well, because we get these ideas. It's the idea that 
we have to have idealism behind every major conflict because if we didn't, then we would recognize what we're doing. We basically are slowly trying to find ways to thin out our own population on a consistent basis through disagreements that lead to violence. That's not a good look for humanity. No. It's not. But it's say it any other way, and you get to justify it. So, sorry, people. If I feel if people feel like I called them out on the carpet on a lot of things, I'll admit there's there is a part where I can't throw away my own personal ideology, and maybe it's not the right ideology. I don't know. I I'm just saying that I like to put humanity first, and I think that approach can be the most effective way to combat terrorism. I'm not so naive to say that violence has nothing to do with it or or war or military involvement and all that. I know that's important. I know that's critical. I know that we need to protect ourselves. And I think it's still an incredibly vital thing to do. I am not denigrating anyone that does that. I think it's amazing. I'm just also pointing out that you need this other component. And many times it gets neglected. Well, we could continue to go on and on, but we're already... Uh droning on uh, at this point yeah. uh, so matt i hope you're happy with whatever <laughs> discussion uh you, you got out of us on this you, you know what and and thinking of your previous radio show in hindsight i think it would have been a good idea to have him on because i know that he's intelligent about this and i know he has strong opinions on this sort of thing so i think he could have been a great potential mediating voice so i didn't go so off the rails with this Fair point, but also knowing Matt as long as I have and as well as I do, you think this got has gone long? You add Matt to this conversation. This is a three hour episode okay. minimum. Okay. <laughs> so and I know he's sitting there listening to this going, Yeah, yeah, he's right. So I think this is about as good a place as any to wrap it up. Well, I said at the start this was going to be a heavy episode, and I don't think it disappointed. I also think that this happened to be one of our most intellectual episodes. And so I hope that you enjoyed this. Uh, thank you, Matt, for suggesting this topic. This one was probably the least comic booky of all of the episodes that we've done. It's like, yeah, let's just use comic books as a background to discuss some really serious parts of our world at large. <laughs> well, to some extent, that's the point of the show in general. It's yeah, just but usually we, we tie it directly, man. This was not direct at all. No, this was, we referenced comic books for maybe 10% of the episode. The it, rest was right. real world The stuff. irony, honestly, I think I referenced more comic stuff than you did. <laughs> that is very, very possible. I'll find out when we go back and edit, or when I go back and edit this, I'll say, wow, I wasn't making jokes at all. Doc was the one making all the references. But in any case, I promise you, next week's episode is going to be way more fun. It's about The Tick. And we intentionally followed this episode up with that one because we knew when we were looking at our episode topics for the next, you know, for the two months that we were given um, the selections by our patrons, we said, well, terrorism is going to be really heavy. Let's follow that up with The Tick because we're going to need a breather episode after that. So, and uh, looking at the, looking ahead to what we've got planned for The Tick, it's it's well worth it. And you are definitely going to enjoy it. So The Tick is going to be followed by Abe Sapien from Hellboy and Yorick, the last, uh, Yorick from Why the Last Man. So thank you to Matt and uh, all of our patrons uh, for continuing to support the show. You can join them uh, by going to patreon.com slash capes on the couch. Uh, our last episode was a preview of our upcoming trade paperback reviews, which will be Patreon exclusive. So the March issue will be lock and key. The first six issues, the welcome to Lovecraft uh, arc. And uh, so you can find us on social media everywhere at Capes on the Couch, and you can email us at capesonthecouch at gmail.com. And as we mentioned at the top of the episode with Luz's five-star review, if you leave us a review and rating, then if you screenshot it and email it to us at capesonthecouch at gmail.com with your address, we will send you a sticker as a way of saying thank you. It doesn't even have to be a five-star review, but if you took the time to rate and review us, we appreciate your input. So... I think that's about covers it. Doc, anything you want to say? Any 
witty pun that you've got for the episode? Nah, man, this is just messed up stuff. Nah, nah. All right. Wow. You know it's serious if Doc doesn't even have a joke. So that's going to wrap it up for Doc Issues. I'm Anthony Sitko. Thank you so much. We'll see you next week. Capes on the Couch podcast is for entertainment purposes only. Dr. Issues is a psychiatrist, but he is not your psychiatrist and does not have knowledge of your individual situation. For any personal mental health concerns, please consult your own health care providers. For medical emergencies, please call 911 or the designated number in your area immediately. Remember that you are not alone and help is out there.